Hi, this is Chris Campbell with the Food Institute, and welcome to the Food Institute podcast. This week, we have Brick Meets Click Chief Architect Bill Bishop with us, and we're going to be speaking about the state of the e-commerce grocery industry in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. But first, if you're listening to us via YouTube, we ask that you subscribe to our channel so you're up to date with all of our latest updates. So I'd like to say hello to Bill. How are you doing today? Just fine, Chris. How about you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, so, you know, we're all working from home these days and it's becoming more and more of a issue for grocery shoppers, you know, trying to find their daily bread. So I'd like to go to a recent report from Brick Meets Click and Shopper Kit Online that found 31% of U.S. households, representing 39.5 million households, used an online grocery delivery or pickup service in March. And this number was more than double that the number your organizations reported in August of 2019. So yep. in your opinion, how many of those shoppers will remain active users of online grocery after the pandemic subsides and how many will return to shopping in stores? Well, I'm not so sure it's going to be as clean as that because a number of people will actually shop both modes. And the real question uh, that we find ourselves asking is uh, how many people are beginning to follow the practice of shopping online and then what proportion of their shopping are they going to do online? But to answer your question directly, if uh, if uh, last month's data was uh, 39.5 million, I think it's conceivable that uh, in the short term, and who knows what that means in this circumstance, but in the short term, uh, uh, we could see uh, that number drop to close to uh, uh, 30 million. Uh, but there's uh, another caveat, and that is that uh, that I think would be the relief of being able to get back to the store. Uh, but expect after that uh, drop off uh, that the number will continue to rise again at a bit faster rate than would normally have been the case because folks would have sampled this, tried it, and uh, uh, and saw that uh, once to get through the first time, it's getting easier every time. I find that to be interesting. Do you guys have an update through April regarding how many households have turned online grocery pickup or delivery, or is March the latest data available? No, we actually uh, just finished a study. I'm glad you asked. And uh, it was uh, approximately 30 days. We tried to time it to 30 days from the uh, March study. So it's in that April 23, 24 time frame. And um, what that data showed was that there was about a 1% increase uh, in households shopping for grocery online. What it also showed, however, was that in that 30-day period, and we do a national sample, the volume, the sales volume done online actually increased 37% on that 30-day period. Now, that was a combination. Two things gave it that 37% increase in dollars, even though only a 1% increase in people. And the largest part was the frequency, that is the number of times people ordered per month. And then uh, there was also a modest 3% increase in the average basket size. So we're still, we haven't bent the curve here yet. We're still on the increase in terms of the pandemic's effect and driving uh, increased use of online shopping, albeit, albeit not nearly as fast as the first time we measured. So that actually flows into the next question I had, which was, are basket sizes for online grocery delivery and pickup on the increase during the pandemic? And you said that's a 3% increase. Now, was that over the last 30 days or just since the start of the pandemic in general? Uh, that's just over the last 30 days. So all the data I'd give you now is just a 30-day period. So that's a, a pretty nice little increase. And what we're seeing basically is is that, uh, you know, from uh, the original couple of weeks uh, around the 12th, 14th of March, when we went on, went through that stock up, frenetic stock up period for household essentials. People have now broadened the number of things they're buying. There are more perishables in the market basket. And it's a reflection essentially of people continuing to eat more at home, probably 
spend a little bit more time cooking. And uh, uh, so the, uh, the market basket is more representative of what would be typically in a grocery shopping trip of, you know, that size. So I guess that would be indicative of a new normal kind of coming. Uh, people turning to more traditional foods that they're used to stocking their, their shopping basket with. Yeah, and it, it is, uh, I guess we're always a little uncertain about what new normal is since the dynamics continue to play out, but it's certainly getting more normal, if not the new normal, uh, going back to the old ways of doing it, or perhaps if you had walked away from as much uh, home preparation of food, uh, going back you know, into the past and restoring some of those activities. So I know, at least in my research that I found, online orders were typically placed by younger consumers in the past, but with stay-at-home orders and also vulnerable populations being encouraged to stay home, have you seen a shift in the demographics that are turning to these online uh, options? Well, the uh, the fastest growing segment today are folks over 50. So we're seeing a real democratization of online grocery shopping. Um, it did used to be skewed to people who are more technically savvy. But now I think it's a much broader from a demographic and tech skill and geographic point of view. It's, uh, it's much more representative of America. Okay, so I was actually going to talk about geographic location as well. Um, do you see specific regions of the country that are showcasing growth at a rate that's higher than the national average? Or are there any kind of distribution issues in rural areas that might be limiting grocery delivery and spurring pickup or even vice versa in urban environments? Well, I, I don't think it would come as any surprise to you, but what we find is a very strong relationship <clears throat> between the number of online order options available to households and the penetration and activity by those households. So what that tells you is, is that in the major metropolitan areas, particularly on the coasts, uh, that's where you'll find four, five, six of these offerings, you know, some of course are available at a national level like Amazon, but others are uh, more geographically connected. You know, you're in the New York area, so you've got a big ShopRite offering, for example. Uh, but uh, what we find basically is a, a strong, much stronger penetration where there is a, uh, there are multiple uh, types of services available. And, and of course that would make sense because as each service comes available, it has different features. And as additional features are uh, coming available, uh, people who were looking for that feature go, yep, that's it. That's all I needed. I'm on board. Now, there's one other thing, though, that's happening that is, uh, we, I may get a little ahead in your questioning, but uh, and that is that there's an amazing focus today on improving the shopping experience. So, you know, as we speak, there are people working very hard to correct any problems and to make it a whole lot easier for anyone to shop online. And so we're going to find that accelerating the growth over the next couple of months, regardless of whether the pandemic, pandemic is top of mind or not. So yeah, kind of piggybacking off that, um, I did have a question regarding, you know, bigger e-commerce retailers. You mentioned Amazon and Walmart. Are they taking a larger piece of the grocery e-commerce pie during this period, or are traditional grocery retailers, you know, maintaining their own pace and getting that share? Well, it's, I'm not sure we have the answer to that. Uh, Amazon uh, has been a huge player for years in all of their services. Uh, there's been tremendous growth, however, in some of the other big players. Uh, the ones that came immediate, come immediately to mind would be Walmart and Kroger. Uh, but we also have situations where hundreds and hundreds of small and medium grocery retailers have begun to offer online services in the last 30 to 60 days. I mean, hundreds. So there's been explosive growth in that area. So exactly how the shares are shifting, I can't tell you, but it's not like the small guys are just being completely taken out by the big people. The small guys are working very hard to provide an option for online shopping for their customers. So speaking of those smaller grocery retailers, what can they do to differentiate themselves from the other e-commerce companies that already have uh, this kind of following with a customer base? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think 
they'll do what independents have historically uh, done to succeed. And if they certainly don't have the scale of buying power. So what they'll do is they'll uh, win on the basis of personal service. Uh, they're, they'll win on the basis of a unique assortment uh, that uh, includes uh, special, what you might think of as signature items that differentiate the retailer. Uh, they may have a, you know, a special ham they make, or they may have a set of bakery products. Uh, there's a five-store retailer in Dayton that has what he calls killer brownies. So uh, mainly through assortment and service. And um, one of the interesting things is that when we did early research, and we've been studying this for a number of years, working in this space, um, almost always customers would prefer, if they could, to buy online from the same retailer that they buy in store. So there was a kind of a natural leaning advantage to the incumbent relationship. And uh, and now I think uh, uh, the smaller ind independents have really moved aggressively to uh, leverage that advantage. That would be interesting. Um, I guess a follow-up question to that then is, what can grocery retailers do to improve both the delivery and pickup services? And what have they done since the start of the pandemic? And what other kind of uh, activities could they do to kind of support their customers and ensure return visits when everyone's so worried about their health and really wanting to stay home? Well, um, I didn't write them down, but there are probably at least four facets to to that question. Uh, let, let me start with, you know, what they're doing to um, correct the situation. Uh, the first uh, step that all of them have done is to say, we watched sort of whole sections of the store be blown out and for our inventories to disappear. So the first thing they're doing is getting inventory on the shelves available for their customers. It may not look pretty. It may be different in terms of brands and size options. Um, but I think in many instances, of course, with notable exceptions, for example, we're seeing a lot of discussion in the, in the meat and particularly pork areas. But um, retailers have done a really good job of at least having products on the shelf. Now, the second aspect of that is that when someone goes to order online, they'll have their list of 10 or 15 or 20 items. Um, and inevitably, some small, ideally small number, but some number of them will still be out of stock. So uh, uh, then the question becomes, uh, the se second thing that the retailers are doing is, how do they come up with uh, what technically we call substitutions? But how do, how do we get people more of what they're looking for, if not all of what they're looking for? So you're seeing some really good work in terms of uh, thinking through substitutions, getting permission in advance to substitute. Um, and you can imagine if if you said, for example, you know, I, I want green bananas, but I want bananas, then if all they have is this yellow bananas, they're going to ship them to you and you're going to be certainly happier than if you had none. So a second area would be that substitution activity. Third area is, uh, you know, just call it the, the occasion to shop. And in both delivery and in pickup, uh, there's been such a surge in demand that uh, a lot of the systems have um, uh, been overwhelmed. So it's been hard to find a shopping alternative because they fill up. And they fill up because they don't want to overwhelm the capacity of their ability to fulfill. So uh, some of them are working to expand that capacity. And one of the ways they've done that, and you'll see it around the country and in Canada as well, uh, they'll take some stores dark. So they'll eliminate the shopping of consumers in the stores, and they'll just make that a factory to produce online orders. So that expands the capacity. Uh, and then um, uh, fourth, 
uh, thinking specifically about delivery, um, you have this sort of uh, wait time to get your order taken and a wait time to have it delivered. I mean, three or four days in the first couple of weeks was not unusual. Uh, but today, uh, a lot of the orders are happening faster than that. And, and part of what people are doing here is uh, making arrangements for uh, types of customers that might be more challenged, older customers, or customers with other restrictions, so that they're not buffeted by the crowds uh, that are affecting everyone else. So that's a good scatter, I think, of the improvements. But I do want to emphasize th these um, enhancements, these improvements, uh, both in terms of problems that were kind of created by the overload and in terms of uh, uh, correcting experiences that just need to get better if people are going to be comfortable with the system. There's a 24-7 effort to get into both of those, Chris. I find that to be interesting, especially the delivery aspect. And one of the things I wanted to follow up on was, is there a market difference between third-party delivery services and then in-house delivery services when it comes to fulfillment? And do you think more companies are going to turn in-house to try to get a better control over this aspect in the wake of the pandemic? Well, that, that's going to be a really important question. Um, first of all, uh, you know, delivery capacities, um, well, let, let me step back from there. Uh, deliver the, the online grocery business until you get to scale and you automate certain activities is not nearly as profitable as the sales you do in your stores. So uh, a number of retailers said, you know, we may do pickup that we can kind of get our minds around and folks will still come on the parking lot and many instances come into the store. But we just as soon let delivery go to a third party. And, of course, Instacart has been the poster child leading that parade. But there are others as well. Um, uh, I think uh, many people went to Instacart. And you've got different levels of service with Instacart. That is to say, different degrees of involvement. Um, so if you're a big retailer and a heavy user of Instacart. It is your primary delivery vehicle. Uh, Instacart, uh, what we would call white labels it. So in the case of Aldi, in the case of Publix, or two that come most immediately to mind, uh, you, you're using a website that says Aldi or Publix, but you're really using Instacart and you're only going to each of those retailers. Whereas in the marketplace that an Instacart offers, you're going to go on there and you're going to be able to go to, in your case, you're going to go to ShopRite, Walgreens, and uh, uh, Costco, and, and a number of other retailers as well in the New York metropolitan area. That's kind of the marketplace concept. So third parties range from this dedicated white label to the marketplace approach, and uh, they've uh, been the majority uh, of capacity for delivery up to this point. Um, main reason being that it was probably the least troublesome way for retailers to handle that. Maybe that's sort of a double negative. Um, over time, I think you're going to see more people take responsibility, more retailers take responsibility for delivery, but they're going to need to figure out how to do that efficiently so that the profitability is there and they don't wind up destroying the economics of their business model. So I think in two or three years, you're going to see <clears throat> probably many more retailers kind of owning the delivery portion of it. Uh, once they figured out how to do it more profitably and so forth. I think that's a good spot to end right there. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time today, Bill. Uh, where can Food Institute listeners go to learn more about your organization? Well, what I'd suggest is, is uh, 
Anybody who's interested, hop on to the uh, internet and take a look at brickmeetsclick.com. Uh, we have uh, a tremendous amount of content on there, all of which is available at no charge. And uh, if you're interested in digging in, uh, the archives are very rich. Uh, and we put up a couple of new pieces of content, uh, all of which is original. We don't publish anybody else's stuff. Uh, every week. With that said, I'll think that'll close this week's edition of the Food Institute podcast. If you like what you heard, please like the video. And if you'd like to learn more, please take a look at our links in our description to learn more about the Food Institute and what membership could do for you and your company. Once again, I'd like to thank Bill Bishop from Brick Meets Click. And until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off.